everybody. Happy Friday and welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Sinead DeFries, and this is The Daily Show, where we bring you the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Joining us this morning is Christian Harlaw. <laughs> Way to get through that, Sinead. Welcome back to Movie Talk, and I can smell it. I can smell it. The electricity is in the air. We are here. The championship match for the Schmodown happens at 2 p.m. today, I can't wait. Dan Merle and, and, a, and a champion I think we're going to meet soon. All right, yeah, we have our reigning movie trivia schmodown champion, Mr. Mark Riley. How are you? Golf class. There Golf he class. Is. Champ is here. Hello, movie Amp talk. Here. Hello, panel. Thank you very much for having me. Now, if you excuse me, I have to go study. <laughs> <laughs> nice having you. And also here, our resident red shirt guy, Mr. John Roca. Yeah, how's it going, everybody? No red shirt today. Sorry, everything's in the laundry. I got a black shirt and a little bit of red with what? Iron Ooh, Man stuff? Does that work? Whatever. Or is that an orange? Turn your phone off today? What? Yes, I turned <laughs> my good. phone off today. Good. Apologies. Good. All right, guys. It's going to be a fun show today. Looking forward to talking movies with these two characters right here. Sinead, what's up first? Before Marvel created their own cinematic universe with 2008's Iron Man, they made a number of deals with other movie studios for their characters, which to this day prevents them from appearing in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. The most obvious are Fantastic Four, X-Men, Deadpool, and Spider-Man, before Marvel and Sony kiss and made up. In that, many believe the popular line of shape-shifting aliens known as the Skrulls were locked up by 20th Century Fox. But apparently, Marvel still owns the rights to some of the Skrulls. In an interview with with Guardians of the Galaxy director James Gunn on the Pointless podcast, Gunn clarified the long-standing misconception. Marvel can use the scrolls in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. They just can't use all of them. Gunn clarified by saying, Marvel only partially owns scrolls. And also for the record, we don't own the Badoon either. So people were asking why we have this, is that Sakarans in the film? We don't own the Badoon. Gunn later clarified his statements on Twitter saying specific scrolls are at Fox, but the scrolls as a whole are co-owned. As to when we might be able to expect a scroll to appear in a future a Marvel film that remains to be seen. Christian, what do you think about Gunn's comments about the ownership of characters left in the MCU? All right, I'm going to be honest about all of this. I don't know about any of it. I'm not going to pretend that I do. Do I think that it sounds cool? Yes, it does. Do I think that I'm even more excited because James Gunn is excited? Yes, I am. And that if they want to use these to kind of further the universe and they think that it fits the story, then I'm all for it. But I, again, I'm not going to pretend that I'm like, oh, yeah, the Badoons and the Zebel Dudes and the Weeps Weeps. I don't, I don't know enough about it, but I do want to learn about it. And that's why these two characters are here. Riley, you're really excited about this. Give me a little breakdown. Why should we get more excited that this is happening? Well, I think it's exciting because it, it's nice to know that we actually own, or Marvel owns us. I was just throwing myself <laughs> in Marvel. You ah, how you doing? Um, I think it's nice that we actually have a chance to see the scrolls on screen. Now, I know Ronan in Guardians of the Galaxy was a scroll. Yeah. So they obviously own some characters. That's what James Gunn is alluding to. I would like to see um, if they own some of them. Maybe we can get all of them. And one of my favorite lines that Brian Michael Bendis did in uh, Lionel Blue, or you, was the secret invasion line of mm -hmm. comics, mm -hmm. which was a great, great, how great is it if like Captain America walks in and you, you don't know if it's Captain America or not. There's so many opportunities for a story there. That's what gets me excited is that if, that we, if Marvel owns some of it, how soon before they own all of it and we can get a secret invasion movie? Like, you know? what's the rights as far as when, when it runs out? That's, and all that type of yeah, stuff? but that's where it's getting a little confusing. That, that yeah. write up, I was like, well, because I was doing the research on the, on the notes this morning. I was like, okay, so they own some, some characters, obviously Ronan. Who else do they own? Yeah. And what stories can lead to something for a Marvel Cinematic Universe movie? Yeah. Well, the, they're a fictional race of extraterrestrial uh, shapeshifters. So, well, yeah, so, uh, keep going. <laughs> but no, but I, I think Wikipedia scrolls, is a great thing. <laughs> the scrolls are great. And uh, the, the fact that they have this war forever with the Screes, like there's so much to explore there, you know, because especially now that's going on in the world, this this whole idea of, you know, religious sectionalism, this sectionalism and these fights between, they could totally appeal to what's going on now. We see in numerous countries what's going on with Muslims versus the world and vice versa and what does this all mean it could really 
be a way of making a social commentary. So for me, I like the gun as clarifying who owns what. It's important so that if we go forward, if they want to explore that storyline for any future Marvel movie, which I think they should, and Marvel has laid the template down to kind of do that already, it would be interesting to see who they own and who they don't own and what deals they could make in the future because it's not like people are clamoring for the scrolls or clamoring, clam, clamoring for the screes. It's only the main characters from the scrolls, like the like Clerd or the Super Scroll or War Scrolls or even Cadre K, which which uh, Professor X led for a while. Mm -hmm. um, for me, I'm looking forward to John the Scroll from the Scroll Beatles. Yeah, they did a scroll version of the Beatles because they're shapeshifters, which was a whole storyline for a while. So they've done a lot of things through the history of Marvel with this, with the scrolls. It's it's just it's good that that Gunn is aware of it and understand clarifying for people like who goes which way about it. So uh, I need to clarify something because I'm getting yelled at in the chat already. Yeah. Ronan is actually Cree. Cree, right? Okay, so I got my facts mixed up. He's not yeah. a scroll, so yeah. I thought that was what he was referring to, especially right. Gunn, that they own some of them. So right. My bad. My bad, Internet. Stop yelling at me. Yeah, right. <laughs> I see it. I see it. Yeah. Um, okay, well, your approval rating for the Schmodown today just went down by 45%. Exactly. <laughs> All exactly. right, what's next? Back in April, Collider reported that Oscar winner Alicia Vikander had landed the coveted role of Lara Croft for the Tomb Raider reboot, with Roar Uthog, director of The, of the Wave, on board to direct. But the movie had yet to secure a release date. Now, thanks to a release from Warner Brothers and MGM, we have an official date set for March 16th, 2018. Tomb Raider will tell the story of a young and untested Lara Croft fighting to survive her first adventure. A similar plotline to the 2013 video game, which saw a young Lara stranded on an island. There's still no word yet on what the plot of the movie will be or any other supporting characters in the film. Riley, what do you think about Warner Brothers and MGM finally setting a release date for Tomb Raider? I mean, it's, I'm glad that they finally did it because uh, back when I was hosting Meet the Movie Press with Jeff Snyder, the one thing that everybody, I would get questions endlessly tweeted to me, when is Tomb Raider coming? I had no idea that this was such a popular uh, IP. I mean, I know that the, the movies were popular, sure, but I, I, they didn't land for me. So I'm really interested to see where they go with this. Um, I like the idea, I haven't played the video game, so, but I like the idea of her being stranded on an island and maybe using that as a jumping off point for the movie, that makes a lot of sense, so that'd be fun. Um, like I said, I'm glad it's coming. Um, now give me some get some more casting. Give me an idea of story, and, and we'll take it from there. Yeah. I think the March release date is brilliant. I think it yeah. is very smart for them to do this because it sets up uh, an opportunity to do numbers in, in March that they that they will be happy with because they Warner Brothers has done well in March, whether you go back and with the 300, yeah. when, when 300 came back, and it was super profitable in March. Batman v Superman came out in March. There, there are movies that do very well for them in March, but what this will also do for Tomb Raider, considering it is a reboot of the franchise with a brand new Lara Croft, it will set up the summer sequel very well because if this movie delivers like they hope it will, and I believe that it will because I think they're going about it in the right way um, because the video game, I did play the first video game. I, I was watching Ray play the second, the, the most recent yeah. one and it looks incredible. Yeah. The detail they put into it, it's got a very, it's, it's got a very um, loyal fan base. So to see them kind of bringing, I, because I didn't like the first two Mm -hmm. uh, Tomb Raider movies with Angelina Jolie. I thought the first one was fine, popcorn movie, but I think that it, it deserves more. I think she could be the, the female Indiana Jones, and, yeah. and she deserves to be, and I think yeah. that this is the version we're going to get. So I love the March date. I think it's very smart for the future of the franchise. Yeah, I agree with you, Christian. I think it's a very smart as well, because you get a step ahead on, on, on summer to see how people react to it, see if people like it, and you get ahead of the competition to a degree, and you establish yourself, and you make great points, Christian. That means a sequel in the summer is possible now, going forward, if this thing takes off, and, if, and it deserves to take off. Lorecroft is a fantastic character, and you're, the video games are awesome to play. I remember I, I was dating a girl a few years ago. She was mad into it. We spent a summer just playing it, figuring it out, playing it together, and it was one of our bonding experiences uh, in our relationship. And it's so so it's so much fun it's to play. Awesome. And, yeah, it was great. <laughs> yeah. You know, she was. It didn't work out, but we were great friends still. Yeah. And we talk. Uh, we talked the other day as we played the new one. You know, kind of what was uh, what, were, what were the issues with it? But it's so much fun because it's such an expansive world that the first two movies that they did with Angelina Jolie, no offense to Jolie or the, the creators, it didn't quite get there, and it should have gotten there because there's so much rich material to explore. So this is smart. You're taking this time plus a great little graphic. What was the graphic? Can we get that graphic? This up? one. 
I mean, who? Look at that! Yeah. Look at that! Who did that graphic? Right. That's amazing! That's look right. at the camera. Yeah. Yeah. She didn't even pose for that. That's amazing work. But like, that's that's what you could see from her that you would get excited to see that version of Laura Croft. And McKenna's a fantastic actress. So, uh, Sinead, are you or were you a fan of the Angelina Jolie movies? Do you know enough about the character? Do you think that this is a good uh, time for this movie to come out? Um, I think so, and I also loved that video game. Mm, I had yeah. it for, what was that, PlayStation 2, mm. maybe? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, and the original Tomb Raider was actually one of my favorite movies when I was younger. Oh, wow. It was okay. like my nice. first like action movie that I really enjoyed. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't, I'm not like, now that I'm older and have rewatched it, I'm not like super gung-ho about seeing a Tomb Raider like right now, but I love Alicia Vikander a lot, mm. um, and I think this could be really cool. All right, what's next? According to a report from Variety, Phil Lord and Christopher Miller, who wrote and directed the original Lego movie and are now too busy with their duties on the young Han Solo movie, will turn their draft of the script over to be rewritten by Raphael Bob Waxberg, best known for the critically acclaimed animated Netflix series BoJack Horseman. The studio reportedly wanted a fresh take on the material, so Waxberg was brought on board. The Lego movie sequel was originally dated for May 26, 2017, and after multiple delays, was finally moved to the spot it's in now, February 8th, 2019. The next movie in the Lego movie universe will be the Lego Batman movie opening February 10th, 2017, followed by the Lego Ninjago movie opening September 22nd, 2017. John, what do you think about the new writer for the Lego movie sequel? I think this is a great idea. It's right in keeping in the vein of what uh, Lord Miller had set out already. Bojack Horseman is a funny sitcom, funny anime sitcom, and it is like out of the mainstream. People don't talk about it that much, but it is revered by the people that watch it. You know, it's a it's a former sitcom star that's a horse that's like wearing these sweaters and trying to go through L.A. and all the weird experiences they have. And they, they have all these celebrity voices that come in and do their parts. And someone described it as Archer meets Arrested Development, and that's perfect. And so when you put that kind of mentality and that vibe and that kind of style of writing and comedy into a Lego movie, it makes me even more excited to see the sequel because it's because what was so great about Lord and Miller is they made him they made uh, the main guy sweet I forget what his name is uh, the, the one that um, Chris Pratt voiced they made him very sweet this could make it a little more sarcastic a little more biting slightly more adult so I would look forward to that that's because that sounds like a lot of fun yeah you know it's funny because I was of course a little discouraged when Lord and Miller weren't gonna continue writing they have at least a draft that this guy's going to be working off. Yeah. I don't know enough about this series, but okay. like hearing you talk about it, reading up on it a little bit, it does seem like this is the type of person you want to carry on what they did. Yeah. It is encouraging because you go, and, and for those guys too, they, this is still their legacy. This is still the thing that they brought to the big screen right. that people loved with the Lego movie. So their names are still attached to it, even if they didn't have, if they're not completely involved going further it's still theirs like it's mm -hmm. still something that they're going to be tied to so by going out and getting someone who they believe can continue their work and continue the tone and sound and, and hearing the show it makes me interested to watch this show because i like the premise but it just seems like it fits the tone of what the lego movie will be so i yeah. think it's i think it's encouraging for fans yeah and i, and I like the idea of a fresh take mm -hmm. and, and you need it because lego movie was so damn good it really was. so let's take it to the next level how do you do that you bring some fresh meat you bring in this guy and and now just based on your your comments john i'm gonna have to check this out as well oh I'm yeah not familiar with it so brother you you i know your sense of humor yeah. you will love this binge it you will love and it. and you're not the only one to tell me that yeah, okay. everybody's told me you got to check this out yeah. bojack horseman is really really mm -hmm. funny it's right up your alley so i like this um yeah we, I, I can't wait for the new i know they keep they've moved the release date out a couple times so now let's hope they stay there gives them enough time to complete another draft yeah let's go i'm ready all right now it's time to check in <laughs> on the wendy cam to find out what you guys have been saying about the topics wendy what have they been saying well, let's talk about squirrels appearing in the MCU. So if the squirrels were to appear in MCU, the chat would be totally all right with it. Some are saying that squirrels could have already appeared and we wouldn't know because they're shapeshifters. Mm -hmm. For the Tomb Raider <laughs> reboot, securing their release date, some are saying that the release date is good because the movie will still be in its own spotlight and not have to worry about summer blockbuster yep. competitions. And uh, some spe speculation here, MK Songbird says, Tomb Raider and Flash both have currently shared the same release date, which means one of those two movies will have 
have to move from that date. And finally, for the Lego movie rewrites, a lot of people are saying that BoJack Horseman is amazing. Some are alarmed by the rewrites. Justin Bradshaw Taylor says, eh, I'm getting worried about Lego movie too. Taking too long and changing writers is worrisome. Yeah, I get those points. And I also understand the optimism uh, if you're a fan of the show. So, mm. all right, now it's time to talk about buy or sell. Sinead is going to read some more topics in the world of movie news. Myself, Roca, and the champ will simply buy or sell it. According to a report from Deadline, one of the original members from the original Flatliners is coming back for another round. Kiefer Sutherland is joining the cast of the reboot of the 1990 film, playing what Deadline is calling a seasoned doctor. He'll join the already cast Ellen Page, Diego Luna, Nina Dobrev, James Norton, and Kiersey Clemens. The original Flatliners starred Sutherland, Julia Roberts, Kevin Bacon, Billy Baldwin, and Oliver Platt, and followed five medical students who decide to trigger near-death experiences by purposely stopping their hearts. As they would delve deeper into their work, the experiments became more and more dangerous and even scary as they are forced to confront the sins of their pasts, as well as contend with the paranormal consequences of crossing a line to the other side. Flatliners is being directed by Girl with the Dragon Tattoo director Niels Arden Oblev from a script by Source Code's Ben Ripley. A release date has not yet been set. Christian, do you buy or sell Kiefer Sutherland joining the Flatliners remake? Chloe. What's going to happen? Is he going to wake up? Uh, he's always whispering. Uh, I'm going to buy it, though. I'm going to buy uh, Keith Sutherland coming back for Flatliners, even though it is a remake. And I'll tell you why I buy it. It's because of the team that is assembled. I like yeah. the writer of Source Code. I like the director of the original uh, Girl Dragon Tattoo. I think that, that it's a perfect tone for the director because uh, it is a dark movie. The original Flatliners... You know, you go back and watch it. Is it a little 90s campy? Sure, but it's still pretty dark. And I thought it was a, a good movie by Schumacher, consider, considering what happened a little later uh, <laughs> yeah. in his career. But I, it's it's a movie that I thought that Keith Sutherland plays well. I'd like to see what role he's going to be playing coming back into this franchise. And I like the cast that they've got so far. So this is, it, I don't think it's anything that's going to derail by if you have just like an unwanted like cameo or it's like, ah, oh, I can't buy it because the, the movie is known by some, but it's not yeah. like, for example, like something for like with Ghostbusters where if they just, if they threw in um, too many cameos, it might be a little, who knows, jarring or whatnot. But this yeah. particular, it, 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 Ghostbusters is a well-known 1984 kind of classic as where Flatliners is more like in the cult status so yeah. I don't think by yeah. putting in Kifa you really throw anything off I, I like it yeah oh I'm a big fan of this I absolutely buy this um, I enjoy the movie I remember this coming out in the 90s early 90s or something went to see and it was like oh it was kind of cool interesting it was a good little cast all of them were just about to blow up or were on the precipice yeah. of blowing uh, I mean they were already blown up to a degree with Julia Roberts and Pretty Woman so all this was happening and Kiefer Sutherland and Julia, Roberts, Julia Roberts got together on this movie right. and there was all that drama that caused the film Runaway Bride that her for her to star in the That's film right. Runaway Bride because she left him at the altar. So this is interesting to me. There's so much about this film that was so much fun. My question is, what are Kevin Platt, Oliver, I mean Kevin Bacon, Oliver Platt, and uh, Baldwin doing that they can't be on the, in the film either? Like they should all be well, clamoring what, for guest spots. But and that's I where I think idea. you get. I you think, think it'll be wrong. I think that's too much. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah I, I think agree. It, I okay. think you start to get into too much of like, oh, okay, what are they doing here? Why do you keep putting everyone? Like one yeah. guy coming back is one thing for one role, but then you yeah. start putting everyone in there. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's fair. That's fair. Uh, because because some of those Ghostbusters guys are coming back from the new film, right? I don't think and that's too much. It's a little weird. Yeah, okay. Fair. But I, I like the cast, too. I agree with you, Chris, and I dig the cast. And I love that writer. Source Code, people don't talk about the film enough. Source Code is fantastic. Ripley yeah. did such a great job with that. And yeah, Girl with the Dragon Tattoo director, so good to see what he can do with this. And you know it'll be darker because he has that European sensibilities. So it'll, he can go as dark as he wants to go. The studio will let him. And this is great material for him to explore. Near-death experiences Films that do near-death experiences really well stay with us. Altered states, all those kinds of things. Uh, even Inception, to a degree, stays with you because it comes as close with the dream sequences to possibly dying. And so it's fantastic stuff, and I think this is the great cast and the great situation, the team that you were talking about. Right? Yeah, I got to uh, say and agree with everything you guys said. And I think that Flatliners didn't quite hit as well as it could have. That's a great point. Because based on the source material, mm -hmm. Now, with this team in place, I think it could be one of those uh, remakes that's actually better than the original, mm -hmm. especially for this one. I mean, and you brought up Ghostbusters, you brought up all these like iconic properties. Flatliners doesn't have that same, it does have this, the cult status, at least for me too. So I really, really like this team. I like that Kiefer Seller in this area, and I, and I agree with you, Christian, I don't think, we don't need to see Julia Roberts pop up. We don't need to see anybody else pop up. It'll be too too confusing. Because when I first read this report, I'm like, wait a minute, is this a sequel? 
Mm-hmm. Like, are we getting a sequel? And this is like grizzled old Kiefer Sutherland coming back going, you don't want to go back into the afterlife. Let me tell you why. That's and then he goes loud. back. It's, it's too loud. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, better. Much better. It's accurate. With, okay, his, with his vodka or whatever yeah. he's yeah. doing right now. So, uh, but yeah, I, it's, a, it's a buy for me. So I'm excited to see this. You know what I'm also excited about is even I, I actually really like Tarsem's uh, The Cell. Oh, yeah. I really like yeah, yeah. that movie a lot. And, and what they did in the dream world with, with D'Onofrio and, and yeah, Jennifer Lopez. Jennifer Lopez. Yeah. I want to see what they do here in this kind of near death, like you're saying, mm-hmm. the near death experience, how they bring that to life, what happens in those experiences. That's where I agree with you 100%, as where I think it could be done so much better now yeah. mm-hmm. because of just the technology and, and the, 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 use, the, the, the things that they can use to enhance those situations. So, yeah. all right, moving on. What's next? The first trailer for Andrew Neal's Goat has finally hit the web based on Brad Land's best-selling memoir of the same name, which was originally adapted by writer-director David Gordon Green. The film looks at the hyper-masculine world of fraternities and their shallow requisites for joining a fraternity house, all told through the eyes of Land, played by Ben Schnetzer, and his already sworn in actual brother, played by Nick Jonas. The first trailer shows the allure of fraternity life and all the perks and parties that go with it, which then quickly devolves evolves into, into a sadistic look at the behind closed doors world of hazing and hell week that can happen in fraternities nationwide. Goat also stars Gus Halper, Danny Flaherty, Jake Picking, Virginia Gardner, and James Franco and will be released in theaters nationwide on September 23rd. Riley, do you buy or sell the first trailer for Goat? Big buy for me. Big buy. This mm-hmm. looks so interesting. Um, I come from, I, I rush a fraternity. Um, thankfully, I didn't go through hazing like this. But I know of this book, um, again, bringing up Jeff Snyder, he broke this scoop that this was being made. This book was snatched up by James Franco. He was very passionate about telling this story because we've heard a lot of the stories that happen. Mm. I was telling off air, like these these kids that were going into the doctor and they were having horrible, horrible stomach aches. And the, the doctor found out all the fraternity guys were swallowing frogs in hazing rituals and it was almost killing them. Mm. So this looks fascinating to me and maybe it'll pull the blanket out from like, this is still going on, I don't care who you are. These fraternities are still hazing the hell out of these kids and this is gonna shine a light on it. And so for me, it's just fascinating to look at and this trailer does it justice, so big buy. I buy it, and I, you know, we brought so a lot of these movies that are coming out now. You know, Tiffany Smith and I had a chance to speak to these guys at Sundance because this is where all the buzz came from with yeah. when they premiered at Sundance. And yeah, the trailer to me looks very interesting, uh, but it also worries me in a certain aspect because there are, like you said, right, a lot of this stuff still happens. But then there's also the other side where there are a lot of fraternities that don't do that, and well, the, sure. the light will be shined on them when maybe it shouldn't be. So. But the story itself and what's happening inside of this world is very fascinating. The thing that I took the most was one of the quotes, and I can't remember who said it, but it was because it looked like and I thought of it, and then I saw the quote come up, and it was Full Metal Jacket meets Animal, Animal House. House. That is yeah. exactly what the, what I felt. It it seemed like there was like it was like a military, if, like it was it was people getting trained to go yeah. into battle, and then it, it, there were the, the the benefits of these parties and the women and everything that was happening there. And I tell you, who was it? the kid, the main kid? Name that, that stars in this in this movie? Schnetzer. Yeah, so Ben Schnetzer. So he yeah. he did not impress me in Warcraft. I thought he was awful in that, but he looks great in this. Mm-hmm. Who he is, is he in Warcraft? He's the main wizard, like the the new the new kid wizard. Yeah, he's not good in that in that particular role. But this role, Oof. this looks like, and I and from what I hear, he wasn't a big Warcraft guy. And that doesn't necessarily mean you can't be a, a you can't get into the role mm-hmm. if you don't know the property but maybe he just maybe the passion just wasn't there but it certainly seems like he's locked into this role so i'm excited about this particular movie because the trailer was pretty good how do you feel about it yeah this is interesting like all three of us have been are were in fraternities or had experience with fraternity so but i have to i i I have to disagree i sell it because i don't want to see a movie about this and i don't like that the trailer is all about dudes beating each other there's worse stuff that happens in those fraternities and they mm. don't touch on it in the trailer and that bothers me. There's inappropriate treatment of women, there's rape, there's terrible things that happen. Might happen in the movie. Yeah, but the fact that they're not putting it in the trailer is because they're trying to get people in the theater. And I'm saying, if you're gonna, if you're gonna do this, do the trailer that makes me want to go see it because it, you're gonna explore everything that happens that's bad in these things. Because nothing, and you're Christian, you make a great point, there's nothing in here that's positive about being in a fraternity. When you see it, there's nothing. There's, and the fact that his brother is in it and, and Nick Jonas is not 
not going to sell me an over. I don't care how many weights he lifts. He's not going to sell me being a fraternity. And so it, just, it doesn't make <laughs> me want to go see it. Like, and then I may not be out of the demographic to go see this film. Me, I enjoy the playful stuff like Animal House, those kinds of things. But I do think if you're going to do a kind of film like this, show everything. Make me understand what about this film is going to make it darker and meaner. I've seen hazing. I've seen that's we've seen fraternity films where hazing happens all the time. I want to see something real, something more grittier and darker. And I want to see you have the balls to put that on a trailer so you can say this is what you're walking into and this is what you're going to get get ready wow i i, I felt i you know totally respected yeah. i felt that they did show that grinniness in this particular trailer but yeah, yeah. i agree and the and the book the the source material is based yeah. on goes into that from Good. what i understand That's i did great. a lot of uh research on this back when it was actually mm -hmm. announced and i was like this book kind of goes well into not yeah. only the treatment of the, the brothers, but the women. And too. this is only the first trailer. So it's we, only for right. yeah. yeah. But Sinead, you watched the trailer also, mm -hmm. and, I, and I was just walking by Sinead, and I was like, this trailer's crazy. It is. Yeah. Um, I I love this trailer. Mm. It's so good. And I, I know zero things about sororities and fraternities. I went to college for like four and a half seconds. And um, <laughs> sororities never appealed to me. It wasn't my thing. And like all my friends were getting ready to do it and like I knew that there was like secret stuff going on and like they would like kind of talk to each other and I knew it was a whole other world and that you get really wrapped up into it and mm -hmm. this trailer for me kind of shows like this brotherhood and like how they want to impress each other and they want to be friends with each other and then it takes such a great turn halfway through the trailer I think the trailer is well done like I think mm -hmm. it's excellent the way they started out because if you're in college and the idea of girls and sex like of course that's going to appeal to you so much the fact that you would take all the other crap that comes along with it because you want to be as cool as somebody else and I think that they they show just enough to get people to watch it absolutely right. Where, right. I mean where's the female protagonist we don't see that in the trailer so uh, well, we, don't we see him going, oh, I'm having sex because I'm in a fraternity. But it's like, well, there's other stuff that happens that's mm -hmm. terrible in these things. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, this particular story, that's yeah. not the story they're telling. Yeah, All, right. All right, what's next? A new trailer has been released for the singing animal-centric movie, Sing. The movie is set in a world like ours, but entirely inhabited by animals and stars Buster Moon, voiced by Matthew McConaughey, a dapper koala who presides over a once grand theater that has fallen on hard times. Buster has one final chance to restore his fading jewel to its former glory by producing the world's greatest singing competition. Directed by The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy director Garth Jennings, Sing also features the voices of Taryn Edgerton, Reese Witherspoon, Scarlett Johansson, and Tori Kelly, Seth MacFarlane, John C. Riley, Nick Offerman, and SNL's Leslie Jones and Jay Farrow. It is set to land in theaters on December 21st. Roca, do you buy or sell the new trailer for Sing? Well, this is interesting. It's a four-minute trailer, which yeah. is yeah. kind of rare for an animation film, I think. You know, and Illumination does this. Who did Despicable Me? And, and I think Secret Life of Pets as well. Yeah. So it's like they're 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 staking their claim in the animation world. So to yeah. me, I. I liked the trailer, so I would say I tentatively buy the trailer, but I did have issues. Like, it's a singing competition. Okay, so you're cute, people sing from different stuff. Recognizing the voices was more of a joy for me watching the trailer than the trailer itself. It seemed like, okay, we're doing another trailer where people are frustrated about they can't follow their dreams. We're going to put a situation in where they can follow their dreams and see what happens. But in the end, you're talking about a singing competition, which means these people we gravitate to and love, we're going to see them all fail, not get to number one. Someone's going to win and someone's going to lose. You know what I'm saying? It's so what is the progression of this and how are they going to make that work with an animated film to make everybody feel good, feel happy, what have you. Uh, and maybe it's just about like being seen. But the songs they've thrown in, especially at the end when she's dancing, they seem kind of shoehorned in rather than organically in the trailer. So that bothers me. But it has a nice vibe to it. I dig the voiceover work. So I will tentatively buy it, but I, I'm keeping the receipt just in case. It's so funny because I tentatively sell it, but for all the reasons <laughs> that you're saying. like Because I, 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 there, there are reasons that... It, watch the, the, the trailer and I'm saying to myself there is something here yeah. that I think I absolutely think that I could take my daughter to see this movie I feel like she's gonna and my daughter's you know four and a half years old she'll be able to see this movie and enjoy it I just don't know if it's gonna transfer over and be one of those movies to where both adults and I don't know if I'm gonna be watching it going oh when is this gonna end stop singing pig um, <laughs> stop singing. Uh, stop singing. that'll do pig yeah. that'll do <laughs> but but you know there are things and it's funny because he even cracks the joke in this when he says oh, I'm gonna do a singing competition and like another one and it's like I felt like this movie Movie almost should have been made like five years ago mm -hmm. you know, or six years ago because like right right when all this stuff the, the competition when the voice kind of came out there's so many different and, and American Idol was still kind of in its heyday but now they're they're starting to fall off and even though America's got talent I guess is the one that's that's really in the forefront now um, 
it could be okay. The voice talent, sure. I think that maybe because you are a voice actor, that maybe yeah. you kind of gravitate towards that. It's probably that. true. Um, but I also say that there, there, I could. I like the release date on it. Mm -hmm. I like the December release date in the, because it makes people. It makes me think they have confidence in it that they would put it out there around the family time that they say this thing could be really good, or they're saying we've got to put it out there because we spent so much money on this voice talent. <laughs> yeah. um, but I don't know. I just the, the trailer didn't really. There was one thing that I think when the pig said something like, "Oh, I'm fine, thank you," How are you? that made me laugh. Other than that, I, it's gonna have to uh, to get me a little bit more. Yeah, I mean. I kind of buy it. Mm -hmm. It's, it's kinda, yeah. you know, I agree with all you guys said. I mean, it's nice to see that talking animals are now progressing to singing, um, yeah. you know, because we have a I lot of these talking animal movies. Utopia, now we have this. It looks cute. I, it's it's not really landing with me, that, but but there are some jokes that worked. I, I liked when the pig was like singing and dancing around in the supermarket, and then the mm. guy goes, clean up on aisle seven. That was awesome, by the way. You know, <laughs> kind of funny, so I'm going to give it the benefit of the doubt and buy it tentatively. Let's see. Great talent behind the, the, the voices. So, you know, sure, why not? All right, very <laughs> curious to see what the chat room is saying about these trailers and for the first story. What are they saying, Wendy? <laughs> for the Flatline remake, some of the chatter saying, why do we even need another Flatline remake? So they're mm. selling that, but they do buy Kiefer Sutherland. Uh, Tiberius Funk says, buy the remake if they make a suitably dark and twisted in Fincher slash Seven kind of vein. For the GOAT trailer, I'm seeing a lot of buys for the GOAT trailer. I am also seeing that they are selling because uh, Nick Jonas is in the movie. <laughs> Chris Robinson says, I thought this movie was going to be a forgettable college movie, but man, this trailer was intense. And Kyle S says, yeah, sell. They might be bringing the wrong target audience and make them feel uneasy while watching it. People have to know what they're getting into. Mm -hmm. Finally, for the Sing trailer, while the voice talents are great, I'm seeing so many cells yeah. for this trailer. It just looks like the chat's getting tired of another talking animal movie, and some are calling this a hybrid of a discount Zootopia and Pitch Perfect. Ooh. Yeah. Uh, that's a <laughs> great classic. Says, Damn. Right? Yeah. Uh, I have to sell this trailer. Unfortunately, the story and humor seems bland and just not interesting to me. Yeah, that, I, that was a great call. Discount Zootopia meets Pitch Perfect. Well said. <laughs> Um, wonder if that same guy that did the Full Metal Jacket meets Animal House. All right, moving <laughs> on to box office predictions brought to you by our friends over at AMC. This is where we're going to crack down on everything coming out, and then this man over here is going to try to continue his streak and see if he can nail the box office predictions. Sinead, what is coming out? How do we think we're going to do this week? Where's that list? I don't have that. You don't have a list? Just look. How do you know? Oh, I'm oh, asking oh. you. What do you right. think? I'm curious. Just, I'm good at my job. I want to okay. hear what you think. Yeah. Um, so these are all coming out. So. Greatest, greatest moment ever. Could have stayed <laughs> in for five. Buses. Maybe you should have stayed those in for five. It's not coming out. Yeah, Ashley. I was like, what am I, what am I Ashley. doing? Yeah. Ashley, can you come please do this? Um, just kidding. She's not here. Um, all right. So am I supposed to? You want me to give my list? Yeah, I want to hear what you think. Okay, so those are all out, and these are coming out this weekend. Do you want us to come back? Except yeah. Ghostbusters. I love that we're doing this like a game show. Yeah. All right, no, these are the five yeah, that I have to choose have from. I have no idea what's going on. All right, <laughs> okay. so. Let, let us start, and how about, we'll start. Yeah, can you, you come guys back start? That's fine. I'll start Jesus first. Lord. All right, all right. Uh, poor <laughs> This is the greatest poor moment ever. <laughs> I don't know what don't, I'm doing it's, anymore. It's okay. Okay, <laughs> about good. on the spot. All right, Cody, mark that. We need to bleep that out for AMC. Okay, so. <laughs> oh, sorry, AMC. Here we go. Here are the. Box office predictions brought to you by our friends over at AMC. All right, starting from me, number one. We're going to get the number one we have coming out this week. Uh, it, it's it's going to be Secret Life of Pets. I, you know, as far as how much it's going to make, I'm going to say it's going to probably be around like the 65, 70 million. But coming in at number two, we're going to have two kids back to back. We're going to have Dory at number two, then followed up with number three at Tarzan. Number four will be Purge. And then at number five, barely, barely will be Mike and Dave's wedding dates. Mm -hmm. Riley? Hmm. All right. Well, in doing my research, Mike and Dave is actually tracking surprisingly well. Wow. Had a pretty good Thursday opening. So I might switch some things up. But. Secret Life of Pets, obvious number one. Finding Dory, number two. I think I'm gonna go, uh, I might go Mike and Dave need wedding dates, number three. Oh, wow. wow, okay. Yeah, I'm, right. why not? I, I mean, appreciate I'm probably your ballsiness. Wrong. I'm, I'm probably wrong, okay. but what the hell? It's a prediction, so I can be wrong. So Mike and Dave at number three, Legend of Tarzan, number four, and I'm gonna go with The Purge, number five. All right, Roka, you're up. All right, I got Secret Life of Pets number one, Finding Dory number two. That just makes so much sense to me. I think Tarzan holds on at number three. There are enough people that are kind of talking that they kind of mm -hmm. like it, so it's enough. I think it's enough to stay. 
I think Mike and Dave need wedding dates be based on what Riley said is correct. It's tracking better than people mm. thought. And it's it's probably a terrible movie. I haven't seen it. Yeah. Who knows? Uh, but but people like that kind of stupid humor. So why not? And I know I'm guilty of certain films. So I would say it's probably number four and then BFG number five. Wow. And I you think take the purge out of there. Yeah, I don't wow. think the purge is getting enough. I don't think it's got enough legs. I think the people who want to see the purge saw it wow, and they're okay. re receding back in the background. And I think seventy nine million for uh, Secret Life of Pets. Seventy nine. We I had about I'd say let's say sixty eight. What do you say? I'm going eighty million. 80 million. Oh, yeah. you prices right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. One dollar. Yeah. One dollar. All right, Sinead, you want to take a crack? Yeah, let's do this. What do you got? <laughs> I'm ready. I, I promise not to swear anymore, you guys. It's I wish Friday. your hair was Come all on. frazzled. Give me a break, right? All right, I'm ready now. Um, all right, I have a kid, okay? What do you got? All right. <laughs> Secret, yeah, that should be my excuse for life. A Secret Life of Pets, um, Dory, mm -hmm. um, Mike and Dave. Okay. Nice. I've heard actually really great things. All right. Yeah, um, see? Tarzan and then The Purge. All right. Mm. That's my list. All right. I want to see Sinead. What, you yeah. guys, what you guys are saying. Start commenting right now. What will be the top five this weekend? See how your predictions are. Come back and check it on Monday when the numbers come out. And thank you once again to our friends over at AMC. All right. Moving on. Before we get to mailbag, real quick, have to mention the title match. Got to ask you, Riley. Yeah, it's going to go down, starting to happen. Dan Merle's got to be the toughest guy you face so far. Reigning movie fights champion over screen junkies. How are you feeling? Ever, oh, man. Toughest opponent ever. Yeah. I have such great respect for Dan Merle. I can't talk any smack for this guy because, one, he's good at what he does. Two, he's a hell of a nice guy. And three, this is just going to be a lot of fun. So I cannot wait. However, oh. mm. <laughs> This is my belt. Nice. <laughs> Here we go. Yeah. So I'm going to go in guns blazing. I'm going to have a lot of fun. I'm going to try to just get out all, all the noise and all the whatever you guys are talking about. All these funny memes you guys are sending me and going, Riley is either going to go down or he's going to win. doesn't matter. We're going to have ourselves a showing. Two gladiators in the ring for movie trivia. Cannot wait. Mm -hmm. Let's do this, Dan Merle. I'm pointing to you, buddy. You know, the Planet Bespin. Yeah. Uh, no, oh, Bespin. No, but it kept you elusive. It kept, it kept you. If had that Bespin disaster never happened, yeah, you would have played Dan Merle. That's true. And then you watched Mance lose to him. Yeah, I did. And now pathetically he, lose to him. But now here's <laughs> Scott. And now here is Merle. Yeah, going for the title. Listen, let me tell you something about the champ. Because the champ is here. The champ is a gracious champ. He's a good guy. He's not going to talk crap about Merle. That's why I'm on the panel. <laughs> Dan Merle. <laughs> You think you could bring your screen junkies butt over here and take on the champ? Take on Mark Riley, my boy, oh the boy. Star Wars dog? Are you nuts? Are you out of your mind? Do you want to lose the rest of what little stubble you got on that head of yours? Huh? <laughs> you want to keep that relationship of yours? I'll give you a new cap to wear that says loser, and you can wear it all around. Got my butt kicked by Riley. I'm going to give you another one so you can wear it on Movie Talk while you fact checking that your butt got kicked. And I'll send you that email. I lost again. That's what it'll say. I lost again. <laughs> I'm not coming back because I got my butt kicked by the champ. Oh, wow. Mark Riley is the man. <laughs> don't you ever, ever doubt it. I can't yeah. wait. Yeah. And I can't wait until this tirade turns against the Scott Mance once August 12th happens. <laughs> Roka versus Mance 2. That's going down. Oh All right, guys. Time for Mailbag where we take your emails. You guys have submitted Collider videos, gmail.com. We have been going through them. Sinead, what's up first? All right, G writes, hi, Collider. You hi. guys, hi. 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 hi, what's up? G, what's up? You guys mentioned Bloomkamp as a director who could benefit from directing someone else's property. Can you think of other directors who would excel from directing a project they didn't create or write, like a superhero property or adaptation of a book rather than creating their own? Yeah, it, it's not someone that needs to do this, but someone that I'd be interested to see doing this is Tarantino. Mm -hmm. um, you, you can imagine it'll never happen. But imagine uh, the announcement that Tarantino is going to do a DC movie or a Star Wars movie or a Marvel movie. It, it, people would lose their minds. And the, to see exactly what that would look like would be incredible. It's just never going to happen. It, yeah. Because he is able to. He's a, he's a guy different from Bloomkamp is the fact that he doesn't need to do that right now. As yeah. Bloomkamp's originals are just not hitting with audiences the way that Tarantino's. And that's not nothing mm -hmm. against Bloomkamp. It's just that's rare. Yeah. For what Tarantino does to write those, like their events, Tarantino yeah. is a, is a damn star. Like he's one of the few directors that, when a Tarantino movie comes out, it doesn't matter what the hell it is, you're going to see it because it's Tarantino. Right. So I would love to see him do like a Star Wars bounty hunter movie. That'd be amazing, but it's just never gonna happen. Yeah. Well, 
I had Tarantino in yeah. my mind. What I would love to see is a Halloween movie <laughs> with Tarantino yeah. directing. He has teased doing a horror movie, mm -hmm. if I remember correctly. Um, wouldn't that be phenomenal to see? I mean, I for me as a horror lover, um, obviously being on Collider Nightmares, there's just something about that iconic mask of Michael Myers just in a Tarantino directed. Wow, that'd be fun. Um, the other one that, that made me interested actually was Nicholas Winding uh, Refn, who was talking about oh, yeah, Batgirl so. the other yeah. day. And this is why this question sounds so interesting. Is like, wow, yeah, he would be great as well. And then I know Fincher does a lot of um, his, own, I mean, he does book adaptations, obviously, of Gone Girl. Um, but wouldn't it be interesting to see him to kind of tackle a Star Wars movie or a, or a you know, and we, that's been rumored. Well, Fincher's so. not far fetched because remember he got a start. He worked on Return of the Jedi, so it's, he did work it's, on Return of the Jedi and obviously Alien Three. So uh, to see him though come back maybe and do some of these now that he's Fincher, yeah, and then give yeah. him a property mm -hmm. that's like a DC, a Marvel, or a Star Wars. Wow, wouldn't that be great? Roku, who you got? Well, uh, Inadatu, I really want to champion mm -hmm. Inadatu because of what he did with Birdman. That's an that's an aesthetic kind of superhero, like a way out there superhero movie. What if he did one that is actual super and his vision on the Revenant, his pacing, the action sequence that he can shoot, all of that tells you if you if you pick, if you pick the right hero for him, all, like he would kill a Wolverine movie. He would kill a Wolverine movie. So I would love to see him get a shot at something like that. I think Paul Thomas Anderson would be interesting because of the epic nature of his films and the human exploration of his characters. It'd be fun to see take the right hero, pair him with Paul Thomas Anderson, and see what emotional stuff they could mine out of that character and the 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 things that they've the character has gone through and my uh, Wes Anderson I would just yeah. love to see a Wes Anderson superhero movie or Star Wars movie it would just be brilliant to see some kind of quirky little thing and there's enough room in comics to create the that have these kinds of characters that are out of the mainstream have their own kind of weird quirky worlds that Wes would be great but my number one guy is Tarantino and I would love to have seen him do a uh, Iron Fist movie mm. or a Luke Cage movie, something more gritty or something more central, something New York-ish. It would been it would have been awesome. I, I know they're already doing the TV series, but he'd have kicked ass at that. He yeah. also would have been good to do Deadpool. Yes, uh, he would have been oh, great. absolutely. Yeah. But I'll, I'll tell you what the, the problem with Inaratu, who I would love to see, he, yeah. he's like publicly taking shots at superhero movies and Marvel movies. Remember, yeah. Him and Downey got into that whole thing. But that's how we are as Latinos, man. We, we're going to take shots <laughs> until you give us the job. Then we're going to commit. But it's only because we want to do it. I so we're going to undercut it because you're not considering us. I like the idea. All right, what's next? <laughs> ben writes, what's up, Collider crew? Hey. I'm currently giving... <laughs> Stop it. I'm currently giving the hospital staff a dose of Collider as I get through kidney stones. Don't Hello. recommend. Ooh, is right. My question revolves around film in Los Angeles. As someone who recently moved to Burbank for the summer, I found myself watching movies set in L.A. What movies do you think best encapsulate the city of L.A.? I rewatched Nightcrawler recently and I had a newfound appreciation. Thanks it's a, as always. Sorry. It's a dated L.A., but I still think that it works and that's Swingers. Well, yeah, it's oh, a yeah. go-to. Yeah, it's right? a go-to. Yeah. I mean, it hits a lot of the landmarks. It's the first time I ever remember hearing about In and Out, and uh, it's it's one of these uh, <laughs> things that you hear with uh, just with Favreau. I related to it just coming to L.A. to do stand up and everything that he was kind of going through during that time, it, and in these places that they were going, this every mon everything that they hit, I saw when I got here, and I'm like, oh, swingers, swingers, swingers. Yeah. Just, everything re reminded me of that. So for me, the go-to is swingers. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I would say L.A. Confidential. That's just I, I love seeing that because you see some of the older ones that are still standing, the old buildings that, st that they shot at that still stand. Pulp Fiction is fantastic to rewatch. If you lived here long enough, you'll see a lot of the areas that they that they go into. The Big Lebowski is oh, a, a yeah. brilliant one yeah, to watch really to see the more one. grittier, dirtier areas, less lower income areas that he lives and and, and exists in. Do you know I have a alleys. friend that actually lives in the apartment? That that was that oh, the really? Big Lebowski's apartment was shot in. Oh really? Yeah. Does he have the rug? That's great. Does he have the rug? Uh, no, no. <laughs> really tied the room together, dude. Really yeah. And then the last two are the more of the darker at night L.A., which a lot downtown L.A., which a lot of people don't really experience, is Collateral and Drive. I think I think Drive yeah. was set in L.A., and so you have more of the dirtier aspects or the grungier aspects at night of L.A. and downtown, and those are fun to explore too. Yeah, Swingers being one of my favorites because that movie came out right at the sweet spot for me as well when I was mm -hmm. in LA, so, but I gotta go Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. Oh, great oh, choice, great That's just yeah. perfect, Absolutely. you, you kind of go all over LA, it's kind of, you know, mm -hmm. it's about the industry, it's about it's about the the under the underground industry, the all, all these wonderful things that Shane Black does so well. Yeah. I would even say, it's 
totally dated, and I'd love to see an updated version of this with Steve Martin, L.A. Story. Oh, yeah. It pokes such great fun of, of the L.A. scene back in the day. And now, of course, it would be so, it's actually pretty good for maybe not a, a reboot per se, mm. but like a revisit or a sequel mm. with Steve Martin. I'd love to see his humor taking on what's going on in L.A. right now, but you can't beat L.A. story for that reason. Yeah, my, my favorite scene is the half decaf, half decaf, day when he's taking the orders and, the, and you're just like, Oh. When you live in LA, you're like, that's a real. That's no longer. It's not a joke. Right. That's oh, real. That's oh yeah, and him talking to all the people at, at that dinner table, yes. it's like, oh yeah, I'm studying the art of conversation. Are you? <laughs> <laughs> that's what. You, and that's the thing about LA. You're gonna meet somebody yes. in LA that has the most random occupation yeah. ever. It's like, yeah, I'm a personal trainer that also does acupuncture on pets. And you're like, what the hell? Okay. Right. right. Um, all right. Now it's time for live Twitter questions. We're gonna take a couple from you guys. Sinead has been going through them. You guys have been asking them. Sinead, what are they asking? Jonathan tweets, Patton Oswald has seen Ghostbusters and apparently praised it on Twitter since he isn't under embargo. Does this give you hope? Um, not, not yet, no, because he's, I, I don't know who he's friends with. I don't know. I mean, I want to, I want to judge her for myself. Um, and I, but I will say that I've also heard from other people that have seen the movie that thought it was going to be terrible and said it wasn't. Some people said that they really dug it and they might have liked it more if certain things hadn't happened. So I have more hope in general, but just because I heard Patton Oswalt say it doesn't necessarily give me the hope, but I am starting to say, okay, because this is what I said going into it. I still think all the trailers are, are bad. I think the way this movie has been marketed is bad, mm -hmm. but Paul Feig is a good director. He's yep. a good comedy director. Mm -hmm. So I do have hope. I'm hoping that I come back and I see it on Tuesday. I hope that I come back and I say, Phew, we, we, we dodged it. They've marketed this thing just really poorly, and this is a good movie. It's it's a decent movie. It's a funny movie, and I enjoy it. That's what I'm hoping. But just one person, I respect Patton Oswalt very much, and I respect his opinions, but I don't think just because he, he saw it um, that I'm going to just say, yep, all right, I've changed it now, and now I'm hopeful. Well, yeah, I I do trust Patton Oswalt, but I'm still, I'm, I'm with you. It's, it's hard to take somebody from the industry at face value I, and I know that can be a little bit cynical, but yeah. especially with Patton Oswalt, I, I trust him with his humor. But at the same point, it's like, okay. However, I have been seeing some reactions. Some of my colleagues are going online and going, well, I can't say anything, but I'm just gonna leave this here. I saw Clark Wolf do something like that. Mm. She was like, I'm just gonna leave this here with the Patton Oswalt comment. So makes me think that she might have liked it. Then there was a couple more that I saw that are saying it's pretty good. So. It does give me hope. Okay. Absolutely, I trust Paul Feig. I think it's going to be better than anybody's expected. I'm going to wait and see though. Yeah, I want. I champ. I'm championing the film. I hope it does well. I hope it it, it, it breaks. Well, not breaks box office, but like whatever. I hope it gets a good box office because I like all the actresses. I like Paul Feig. And I don't want people to use this as an excuse to not cast women in films again. We're not going to go that stupid route again. Like it's women are funny. They can be very funny. Show put them in the right situations. If men can fail in comedies, women can fail in comedies. Don't give me that crap. So for me, um, I'm happy Patton put this out. Does it make me want to watch the film anymore? No, I'm already going. Does it make me believe him? No, because it's a human being. He could like something that I don't like. It doesn't mean because he likes it, I'm going to necessarily like it right. even if I love his humor right. it doesn't mean because I don't know who he's involved with in the production he's a comedian yeah, he's, he's, got, a comedian. he's got a lot of comedian types right yeah. right so it's just it's it's that kind of thing where you're supporting your fellow actors and good on him for doing that I think you should uh, but like it doesn't make me think it's going to be any better or worse than I already have I've seen the trailers well, I'm with you Christian none of the trailers make me excited to see it but the backlash I've kind of pushed back against the backlash and I want to see it All right. okay what's next Daniel tweets, I'm going to my first con next week, Celebration. What is your favorite memory from a con? Also, will Perry be putting up videos? Uh, the f to answer that question, yes, you will. So the way it's going to work, Perry is going to be Skyping with me. Um, we are going to talk about whatever, the, whether she goes to a panel or if she interviews somebody, her and I are going to kind of, li we're going to record Skype videos and I'm going to kind of give her some in interviews about things that she has seen, kind of full reviews that we can get from her. And those will be Collider slash Jedi Council videos that we will put up. So Perry will absolutely be putting up videos throughout the entire con um i will tell you that my my favorite moments come from star wars celebration and and yeah it's obviously because i'm a big star wars fan but there's something about star wars celebration that i told it, it, it's it's when you go to any other comic-con or any other con 
there are things that you're gonna you're gonna make a right and you're going to love, and then there's you're gonna make a left and you're like, that's ah, not for me. Yeah. Star Wars Celebration, everywhere you go, it's like, wait a minute, that I love that, I love that, I love that, I love that. And for me, that moment of seeing the trailer when they opened up oh, and seeing man. the Force Awakens trailer and feeling the energy in that room, uh, it was just like I, I never felt anything like that before. It was like being at a really great concert when 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 a band plays a song and every you just feel that moment where everyone is just in sync that's the way it was there like when they showed that trailer the screams the yells the passion from the from jj and kathleen kennedy the passion from the fans the excitement in the area I, i've never felt like that before inside of a con so that's the one that was the most special for me how about yourself yeah, yeah. uh i've been to what eight years of comic con now wow. there's so many special moments but for me it happened last year really special moment and i don't want you to blow up about this but like it happened with William Shatner. It was at a Shatner panel, and I went. It was a two thousand seat uh, panel, which he usually does smaller ones when he goes to Comic Con. It's been in my experience, and I've been unable to get in. The thing about my connection with William Shatner and Captain Kirk is, it's very much my dad. That's my dad. Captain Kirk is my dad. Like nice. the way he behaves, the way he acts, the way he speaks, all of that is so reminiscent. His energy, his essence, with my dad. So I finally got to get up there and ask a question of Shatner about Captain Kirk and his enduring legacy mm. and the character because people put him down for being, uh, you know, with women and all this kind of. There's all kinds of stuff that goes on with Kirk, or that it's cheesy that show, but there he endures. His legacy endures. And so, and then I got to tell him how he reminded me of my dad and the reason I love that character so much. It's because of my and he just gave such a great answer and really appreciated it and uh, he, he you know he said condolences about my father's passing but to me i'm like that's that's mine i keep here yeah you know and great. that's one of those little moments that you get and as fans even being on this set talking about movies it's nice it's a great experience we're still fans and yeah. we still have those people that affect us and shatner is definitely one of them yeah uh, I Star Wars Celebration, I've had so many amazing... I've been lucky enough to be a part of the Star Wars trilogy in 30 minutes, which we oh, do yeah. all three Star Wars movies in 30 minutes on stage. I played Obi-Wan and the Emperor. Probably some of the best times of my life. <laughs> it's going with that cast to Star Wars Celebration. I was there for Phantom Menace. I was there for uh, Attack of the Clones and then uh, Revenge of the Sith and then a few after. So when we did this, one of my best moments was when they took us in for Attack of the Clones. They're like, hey guys, you want to check this out? They took us into the auditorium where they revealed the clip of Yoda fighting Dooku. Oh. Now, sure, it was kind of like, later on you could look back and go, oh man, they kind of took away some of the mysticism of Yoda. But I tell you, man, in that moment, in that auditorium, that was amazing. Mm -hmm. That was like rock star stuff where Yoda just ignites his lightsaber and everybody lost their mind. And then, but the very best was when J.J. Abrams came and watched us perform, and then he came backstage and hung out with us afterwards, awesome. talked to everybody. He was just a regular dude walking around with his kids at one of the Star Wars Celebration conventions. Yeah. That was so much fun. And then to think that, you know, 10 years later, he was gonna be directing the return of Star Wars was amazing. And maybe second was going to <laughs> combat excuse me, Comic-Con with you and Ellis that first time where it was just yeah. the three of us yeah. and we were still building the Schmoes brand and yeah. we were running around everywhere with a camera just <laughs> trying to sleep. I was sleeping on the floor at one point. It was like, that was a lot of fun. Yeah. Too. Um, all right, let's take one more. All right. Only one more? That's it. All right. We're I'm running out of time here. All right, I'm just, okay. Have you ever interviewed anybody at Comic-Con that was like the number one person you've ever, like to you, the number one experience you've ever interviewed? At Comic-Con? I mean, Or any of the cons, well, I guess. Well, I mean. Even uh, Celebration. You, well, Celebration, I mean, uh, afterwards, I mean, the, the thing that I was, it wasn't Celebration, but it was, it was, I was able to interview the whole cast for The Force Awakens. That, to me, was yeah. something that, that stood out. But last year's Comic-Con was really cool. I mean, um, we had, I had to go through, we, we had a bunch of interviews last year. Uh, Del Toro. We sat down and uh, Tiffany and I just interviewed Del Toro for a while, and that was really cool. Um, cool. Yeah, I, and then this year we're, we're interviewing a lot. I'll be there covering for Fandango, and That's we have cool. like a whole space at the Hard Rock, and we're just going to be interviewing tons of people. I'm That's hoping awesome. that we get Justice League people. I yeah. think that might happen. We'll see. Uh, okay, last one. All right, Craig says, what's your favorite movie memory with your parents? Mine is lining up around the block with my dad for Empire at 1980. Nice. Uh, yeah, we we had a similar question just the other day, and I, I'll just go back and say the same one. And it, it's when my dad, who didn't ever really go to see movies twice, but when Back to the Future came out, he had just seen it. And he's like, "I'm taking you to see this movie," and <laughs> and and I, I was I'm, I don't know seven or so, and I saw it with him, and just remember the excitement he had with that. And then it was also Return of the Jedi. I remember. Oh, you think it was Jedi? Uh, seeing with him, at, but the, but Back to the Future is the one that got me. Yeah, Return of the Jedi with my dad. We went, waited in line, did the whole thing. 
when we got into the auditorium, some guy got in front of the theater and let us in and give me a J, give me an E, give me a D, give me an I. <laughs> and my dad was like, can you believe this? He was like, he got so hyped because of it. He was like, this, is really, this guy is really excited. Are you excited? I was like, yeah, dad, yeah, I'm excited. And then we watched the movie and we come out. My dad looked like a little kid. All he wanted was a speeder bike. He's oh, like, awesome. I need a speeder bike. That's what I want for Christmas. Uh, Mark, I want a speeder bike. <laughs> and I was like, in my head, no kidding. I was like, how do I get him a speeder bike? <laughs> my dad, I got to get my dad a speeder bike. How do I do that? So that was by far one of my best experiences with my dad. In, in a movie theater, is that the question? Yeah. Just okay. like favorite, favorite movie memory. Oh, well, to me, and this is actually kind of an interesting question because it really kind of vibes with what's going on this week on, on the cinephiles. Like, uh, my favorite movie is, is Amadeus with my dad. It's oh, my dad's yeah. favorite movie. It's nice. my dad's. I mean, it was his favorite movie. We watched it all the time. It made him laugh like crazy. And you're talking about a guy who is the son of, of, of farmers in Cochabamba in Bolivia, in a small-ass town in Bolivia, he, and his appreciation of, of the life of Amadeus Mozart. My dad wasn't the most, you know, he wasn't like accomplished a theologian or anything. He's a, he's a regular working guy. But for him, Amadeus really, really affected him. And he took me to the theater to see it. And we saw it together. And we saw that all the time. Mm. Whenever I come home or when I was home, we would watch it all the time, laugh about it, do quotes. I mean, my dad was the first one I ever did movie quotes with through through uh, through a dinner or through hanging out somewhere, making jokes about it. And when times were tough and we couldn't communicate, those those quotes always came in handy in certain moments. Yeah. So yeah, that's definitely my favorite movie experience with my dad is, is that. How about you, Sinead? Um, I've talked about this before, but I was 13 and um, it was like movie night and my dad got to pick the movie and he had no idea what he was deciding when he chose the 40 year old virgin oh, right. Right. <laughs> so I was awesome. 13 my sister's four years older than me so we're both like I was like in eighth grade she's in the senior in high school or junior in high school and my parents and my dad's like oh yeah I got the unrated version it's gonna be really funny it's rated R but it's all right <laughs> and the very first scene of the movie like when he goes to the bathroom at the in the morning <laughs> um it was one of the most awkward experiences <laughs> I have ever been through in my life and that's saying a lot um, but for some reason, I just find myself watching really inappropriate movies with my parents. And we've talked about this on Mailbag before. It happens a lot in my family. I don't know why. Now that I'm older, it's not as big of a deal. But yeah, I mean, I was 13 years old, had never had the talk with my parents. And there we were watching 40 Year Old Virgin. <laughs> All right. <laughs> great. And with nice. that, that's our show. <laughs> uh, I'd like to thank everybody on the panel today. First, starting over at the Wendy Cam. Wendy Lee, where can they find you? You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat at Wendy Lee Zaney. Mr. Roca, John Roca, where can they find you? Guys, you can always find me at The Roca Says. You see the shows I'm hosting, the shows I'm co-hosting, and the shows I get to be a guest on, like Movie Talk all the time. And please, the Top 10 Show, new episode, just yeah. screened a couple days ago. Top 10 Talking Animals, pretty awesome <laughs> stuff. Sadly, I don't think anybody from Sing is going to be in that, is gonna be in that oh, list yeah, if no. we ever redo it. Uh, but yeah, that's, it's a fun time. Me and Matt know is just talking movies and you guys. Um, thanks everyone who watched the Spielberg one. Thank you so much. Like it's, It was such a surprising number of people and so happy that we got that many to watch. So please keep watching. It's a, two, it's a couple of idiots just shooting the crap about movies and we love it. And please come join us and, and enjoy that. And also The Cinephiles is my new podcast. And that's why I mentioned it. The new episode came out today. Uh, me and my film professor friend Steve Morris were breaking down Amadeus for an hour and talking about its legacy in the history of film. All right, and here he is. He is the reigning movie trivia schmodown champ. Where can I find you? Well, you can find me <laughs> today <laughs> playing Merle in the movie trivia schmodown. The I champ is wait. here. So, guys, check that out, please. Give me a little support. It's going to be a great one. I can't wait. And then you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Riley Around, and I'm going to be on Sunday's Mailbag. I'm on uh, every Thursday with the Schmoes No Main show and on Collider Nightmares every Tuesday. I'll be there talking horror, maybe Quentin Tarantino directing a Halloween movie. Let's do that. Sinead DeFries, where can I find you? I'm online at Sinead DeFries and at ThatSoSinead.com. Here on Mondays hosting Collider TV Talk, on Fridays hosting Movie Talk, and over the weekend hosting Mailbag. And for me, you can find me, Christian Harloff, Twitter and Instagram every Thursday on The Schmo Show. Last night, I was almost attacked by a cat. So if you want to watch that, that's up right now. And man, was that cat abusive. So go and watch that. It, it, was, it was a lot of fun and scary. Uh, yes, the cat punched the director of Tickled right in the nose. Um, but other stuff, Jedi Council, that happens on Thursday. And myself and Mark Ellis will be hosting the movie trivia Schmodown. It's going down. Make sure you check that out. Thank you guys, and we'll see you tomorrow. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. 
Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.